Hello, my name is Tom Menz. In this lecture, I will explain you how to do unit testing in Java using JUnit4, and I will also explain how to do coverage testing based on these unit tests using an Eclipse plugin which is called uh, Eclema. The example that I will use for explaining all of this is the example that I have also used in previous video lectures, and it can be found on the Bitbucket uh, repository bitbucket.org slash domains java state design pattern so there you can find all the sources java code and unit tests so let me now start explaining the example so i will briefly recap the example of the state chart what we implemented was timer functionality and stopwatch functionality it was implemented using the state design pattern here you can see a small UML class diagram that reveals the structure of the Java code. We zoom in a bit, but you can see what's happening. There is some kind of graphical user interface which has some event listeners. So in the user interface there are three buttons that correspond to the left, up and right event which are sent to a context class and this context class sends the event further to a abstract state and the abstract state has many different types of concrete substates, which you can here, see here on the left and on the right. And each of these classes correspond to a state in the state chart. Now, all of this has been implemented in Java. So let me go to the Eclipse environment. You can find all the Java classes, which are also stored on Bitbucket, if you want to look at them in detail. And now what we want to do is start writing unit tests for them. So the goal is to write small tests that allow us to test uh, the behavior of this application. Before doing so, however, let me explain you the notion of uh, code coverage. So here I have already installed the Eclipse plugin Eclema. And with this we can test the coverage of a Java application. So it opens the graphical user interface. And while the application is running, all possible calls to classes and methods will be captured so that we can see which fraction of the application is actually being executed. So let me just start running the application a bit. I'm going to set the memory of the timer. It's done. I'm going to run the timer, uh, put it on pause, run it again, changing to the stopwatch mode, run the stopwatch, reset the stopwatch, go back to the timer mode, uh, it starts ringing, let's reset it, and then we go back to the stopwatch mode, we run it again. And so there we have a specific execution of the chronometer functionality with stopwatch and timer behavior. So now what is the result of this in terms of code coverage? What the tool has generated for us is the coverage of the application. So apparently 90% of the code that has been written has now been covered during the execution and it can be subdivided into the different packages. So here we see that uh, almost all of the packages have been executed uh, to a very high percent and we can see inside which classes have been executed and which fraction of the classes. Everything that is shown in green has been executed, everything that is shown in red has not been executed. So here for example we see some exception that has not been caught. So let me just show it with another one. Okay, apparently there are two static methods, get timer and get memory timer, that have not been executed. So that's about coverage. It allows you to see when you're running the code, is there any obsolete code left or is actually all of the code being executed. So now the same idea can also be applied for, for unit testing. So I will come back to this coverage testing later. But first of all, of course, I need to introduce a unit test. Um, let me first start by creating some unit tests. So the first thing I will do is to create uh, some new uh, package in which I would like to store my unit tests. So I will give it the name multichrono.tests. Now in this new package I can add a unit test file. So you can specify to insert a new JUnit test case uh, which can be used either uh, with the JUnit 3 framework or the JUnit 4 framework. Uh, in this lecture I will use the JUnit 4 framework because it's the newest version. So I have to give the name of a test class. Let's call it just test uh, scenarios. Uh, apparently JUnit 4 has not been added to my 
build path yet, so Eclipse automatically suggests to add it. And now we see that already some template code has been generated. We have an annotation, which is either before or test. Before will contain the code that will be executed before each test is launched. And test is a method that contains the test to be executed. In order to run the test, I will have to start configuring everything that's needed for, for running the test. For example, I will have to set the context of the state machine. Of course, I will have to define first this variable, which I import from some other class. I can start implementing the test. So this is a very simple example of a, a unit test. I will take two values, two objects in this case, and compare them with each other using the assert same predicate, which will verify if the two objects refer exactly to the same object. To run this test, I simply check run as, and then here it automatically recognizes it's a unit test because we have the necessary import statements from JUnit. And then the JUnit testing framework will automatically run this test and it will succeed if the test is okay, it took 0 0.001 seconds, or it will give a failure if the test assertion is false, or it give an error if during the test something uh, unexpected happens. So let me just show you what happens if here you would have made a mistake. For example, suppose that here we thought that the initial state was not idle timer but running timer. In that case, I run the test again. Then we indeed see a failure because the assertion is not correct. Uh, here we can see the, the problem. The assert same expected an object of type running timer, which is the first parameter, but the object that was uh, returned was an object of type idle timer. So this is the, the source of the test fails because we do not get the response that was expected. Now we could also write some other tests here. For example, we know that uh, if we are in the timer mode, that we have two variables, mem timer and uh, timer, that need to have some value. So I will check if the mem timer value, which is stored as a static variable in the active timer state, has the value zero. Again, I need to import active timer first, and the same for as equals for the memorized time, which is also stored as a static variable in active timer. So in this case, I'm just verifying if two values are the same. I can run my unit test again. The test still succeeds. I can also, of course, decide to split this into separate tests. And then, of course, I have to give another name for each test method. By convention, we always prefer to put the name test as a prefix for each test method. So now rerunning the test again, we'll run two tests, one test method each, which in this case both succeed. Now let's have a look at the test coverage. What is the current coverage of my code using all of these unit tests? The unit test runners will run all possible tests and the coverage framework will start looking at which are the fragments of code that have actually been tested. And here we can see the results. The results are pretty bad, which is of course normal because we only have written two tests yet. Okay, of course, all the tests give 100% because all tests are executed, but in the rest of the code we see that most of the packages are very lowly tested. For example, the graphical user interface classes have not been tested at all. The timer states have been tested to some extent. It was only idle timer that has been tested, but all of the other states have not been tested yet. And the same is true for the stopwatch states, where there's only one that has been slightly tested. You can look at uh, which are the parts of the code that have been executed. Uh, and again, we can see in red those parts that have not been tested yet, compared to those parts that have been tested. So now the goal of this coverage testing is to try to increase the coverage of all code to make sure that as much of the code has been tested. Of course, reaching 100% of Coverage should not be a goal by itself. It's much more important to write tests that are of high quality, so tests that actually do something useful. So let me now go back to the codes and give you another example of a test. 
I would like to test some useful behavior. So for this I'm going to add another test in which I'm going to do a small simulation of my state machine. Okay, let us see which scenario we would like to test. To do so I'm going to run the application first. And let's say that we want to test the fact that we first set the memory of the timer and then we stop it and we start running the timer and after a while it will become in the ringing state. So how can we test this? The first thing we did was we clicked on the right button and we execute its corresponding behavior. To do so we need to invoke the tick method in the class context which actually executes whatever has to be done in the current state. So with this I have already uh, received one event which uh, has allowed me to go to another uh, state. So we go from the idle state now using the write event to the set timer state. So this is already something I can check. I should be in the set timer state. My current state should be, have become the yeah, set timer state. When we run the test, we see that indeed this test scenario succeeds because we see a small V here. But now we see something other strange happening. Another test that uh, succeeded before now fails. And so what happened? In fact, our tests are not completely independent one from another. The problem is that whenever we start running one of the tests, the static variables are stored somewhere in the active timer and their values may be modified and thus may affect the results of other tests. So this is a typical example where we need to uh, make use of the before method, which is a method that will be executed before every other test. The source of the problem here is in fact that while we are running the state machine, it is possible that the values of the timer and mem timer variables change, uh, which is the case here when we go to the set timer, the, we are starting to initialize the value of the mem timer variable, and because of this, it will no longer be equal to zero here. So to solve this, I have added an extra method in the abstract timer class which uh, will reset the initial values of timer and mem timer to zero. So if we use this method and we add it, so before running each test, we will reset the initial values of the static variables. So we run the test again, and now we indeed see that the three tests succeed. So writing tests is often an iterative process, so you should really take care that each test is really independent of the other one. So now let me write one more test for a part of the code that has not been covered yet at all, in particular the graphical user interface, because we see that there is 0% of coverage. So I'm going to add a new test class. Let me call it a test graphical user interface. We will of course have to define a variable that represents this graphical user interface. I of course also need the context of my state machine. And I have to initialize them before each test. So I define a context and I create a new swing graphical user interface with this context. To avoid the problem I have had in my other tests, I will also reset the initial values of the variables used in the state machine and then I can write a test for a graphical user interface. Whenever my user interface is updated, for example because in my context a certain event was received by clicking on the right button, in that case I should check that in my user interface, the text labels of the buttons actually correspond to those texts that are received by the context. There are three buttons, B1, B2 and B3, that all have 
some text label and this text label should be the same as text that is received by the context by method get left text for the first button get up text for the second button and get right text for the third button here we can see it indeed that the text of the first button should be the one that is from received from the context dot get left text and similar for the other buttons you can do this for the first button the second button and the third button And if I again run my unit tests, so now there are four tests that have been run in two different classes. I see that the test has succeeded. If I would have made a mistake, for example, I would have switched the buttons B2 and B3 here. In that case, of course, the test uh, would have failed because uh, we see that the label of one of the buttons is not the one that is expected. So we have added this other test, so normally this should have favorably increased our test coverage. And indeed, if we look at the test for the perfect user interface, we see that the percentage has uh, been increased. So part of the Swing graphic user interface has indeed now been covered. In the same way as we have done before, we could continue adding more and more tests, always with the goal of writing tests that capture the behavior of the application and also increase the test coverage. And after a while, we will get more and more tests. So here I have shown this. I have now two extra test packages that I have written. Now the coverage of the application should be quite complete. If I run all my unit tests now, now I have 23 tests split over six different test classes and I see that in terms of uh, coverage for all the source code I have a very high coverage uh, in all my different packages.